Hi, this is Denver here. This video is part of my series on literary criticism and theory. So today we'll be seeing a English critic. In my previous videos I, I talked about Greek critics and Roman critics. So in this video I'll be talking about an English critic. The English critic I'll be talking about today is Philip Sidney. Philip Sidney is an important figure in literary criticism. Of course, the other critics who were before him, like Thomas More and Ashram and etc. But uh, Philip Sidney was the first person to defend poetry or literature against the assault of uh, people who are opposing poetry. So you should understand the times in which Philip Sidney lived. So the Catholic Church was very weak and uh, the Anglican Church emerged in uh, England and um, there was a great emergence of Puritan thinking, Puritans and they Puritans were a radical group of Christians so they opposed uh, poetry, uh, drama etc. So the, there were liberal uh, Protestants who agreed to uh, poetry, uh, drama etc. But also the, there were a lot of allegations laid by these Puritans who had a lot of power or a lot of influence during those times. So Philip Sidney was one of those critics who defended poetry. So his famous work is Apo Apology for Poetry or it's also known as uh, Defense to Poetry. It was actually a reaction against Stephen Gosen's uh, School of Abuse. School of Abuse was actually dedicated to Philip Sidney as an insult because Philip Sidney had written so many other literary works like Arcadia, Astrophil and Stella which were actually romantic and the Puritans actually dislike literature for its depiction of romantic love. The full title of School of Abuse was The School of Abuse containing a pleasant inventive against poets, pipers, players, jesters etc. He even called artists as the caterpillars of a commonwealth. Philip Sidney himself summed up the allegations into four points. First, that there being many other more fruitful knowledges, a man might be better spend his time in them than in this. Second, that it is the mother of lies. Third, that it is the nurse of abuse. Lastly, Plato was right in banishing poets in his ideal republic. You can also see Stephen Gosen's allegations in the simplified form. Philip Sidney counters the first argument by defining poetry. Poetry, therefore, he says, is an art of imitation. For so Aristotle terms it in his word mimesis. That is to say, a representing, counterfeiting or figuring forth to speak metaphorically a speaking picture with this end, to teach and delight. According to Philip Sidney, poetry is the best way to teach a particular idea to the people. To teach and delight is an idea borrowed from Horace. But Philip Sidney moves one step forward to say that poetry in a way is better than nature. It's not just an imitation of nature, but having the ability to create something that were never in nature, such as superheroes or demigods, cyclops, chimeras, etc. which are actually not the in nature, but it's a poet's wit that creates such uh, wonderful creations. Philip Sidney unconsciously goes beyond Aristotle's concept of imitation. Philip Sidney also mentions Greek philosophers like Thales, Epidocles and Paramedes who used verses or the poetic form to express their natural philosophy. Even people who are technically not poets use poetry to express their ideas regarding philosophy, history, medical science, laws, etc. Even books from the Bible like Psalms, Songs of Songs, Ecclesiastics, Proverbs, the Book of Job, etc. uses poetry to express its ideas. According to Philip Sidney, poetry is greater than philosophy, history and even natural sciences. According to Sidney, human sciences like history, philosophy, etc., theology, etc. are superior to natural sciences. Philosophy is highly abstract, whereas history is concrete and particular. 
poetry is superior to history and philosophy because it combines both of their merits and because poetry communicates universal truths. This idea is actually borrowed from Aristotle's idea that poetry is superior to history. According to Philip Sidney, Aesop's fables communicates philosophy better than any philosophical treatises. He demonstrates it with an example. Now we'll just see this quote. Anger was a short madness. This is what Stoic philosophers came up with. But Sophocles expressed this idea in a better way by showing Ajax killing sheep and oxen, thinking them to be a Greek army. Philip Sidney establishes that poetry is of all human learnings the most ancient and the of most fatherly antiquity, as from whence other learnings have taken their beginning. Defending the, the second charge that poetry is the mother of lies, Philip Sidney says that poets never say what they write is true, unlike historians and philosophers. So they never actually lie. The poet, he nothing affirmeth and therefore never lieth. Philip Sidney goes on to say the story of David and prophet Nathan from the Bible. King David falls in love with Bathsheba, gets her husband killed and marries her. Thus he commits adultery. Prophet Nathan visits David and tells the story of a rich man who steals the only sheep from a poor man. Through this parable, Prophet Nathan makes David realize his own sin. So, was Prophet Nathan lying? To say that he was lying would amount to blasphemy. Against the allegation that poetry is the nurse of abuse, Philip Sidney says, Not say that poetry abuseth man's wit, but that man's wit abuseth poetry. So, it's the poets who abuse poetry and not the other way around. Against the allegation, that Plato had banished poets from his ideal republic, Philip Sidney writes, So doth Plato upon the abuse, not upon poetry. Plato found fault that the poets of his time filled the world with wrong opinion of the gods. So Plato was against the abuse, not against the art of poetry. Philip Sidney was one of the first persons to apply classical rules to English poetry. In his apology for poetry, he praises Chaucer's Trollus and Chrysidy, Earl of Surrey's lyrics and Spencer's Shepherd's Calendar. About Gobidoc, the first English tragedy, Philip Sidney says, It is full of stately speeches and well-sounding phrases, climbing to the height of Seneca's style. So, Philip Sidney believed that tragedy should follow the Senecan style. He also believed in the strict following of the three unities, that is unity of time, place and action. One of the reasons he praised Gobidoc is because it followed the three unities. Regarding grammar, Philip Sidney believed that poetry need not follow grammar rules strictly. One called learning one's own mother tongue in school a curse. Philip Sidney also famously said, music, I say, the most divine striker of the senses. This quote has survived antiquity. Philip Sidney's Apology for Poetry inspired Shelley's A Defense of Poetry. Apology for Poetry is a great step towards liberal humanism. Literary critics started leaving back religious arguments and started using secular logic to judge a literary work. Like and subscribe to Denver's Point of View YouTube channel.